the only thing is we have to mute the YouTube. Yeah, the button looks different. Usually it's uh, round and it has a red center. Now it's more rectangular with a live in the, the center. Only thing is we have to mute the YouTube. Yep, okay. I'm learning as we, this is all day in the life. Okay. Alrighty, good evening, everyone. This is attorney Robin McCoy with Political Coffee with Robin and Tracy. And we have our honored guest, Francis Walters, who's with the Washtenaw County uh, Prosecutor's Office. And today I, I have the uh, perfect apropos mug. I have a uh, slow down, which Nurse Pam will be happy. My mom, Nurse Pam, kept telling me, you need to slow down, you're always running. Uh, and I'm drinking, um, my tea is, um, what do I have today? I have the Breathe Deep Tea and I have, um, it's also some other herbal tea in there with lemon and honey. Uh, Tracy, what about you? Well, good evening, everybody. I hope uh, everybody's doing great. This is our second week doing a weekday show and thanks so much for watching us. And I, today, Robin, have brought my Senate mug because I'm still asking everybody out there in America to call their senators to support the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act of 2021. I know you might have heard about um, Attorney Bakari Sellers reading um, Senator Kristen Sinema and uh, Senator Joe Manchin's uh, office numbers on the air. And I've got their numbers right here on this mug. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. But inside, my mug, I have French vanilla coffee, which I really need for an early evening pick, pick me up. And I can't wait to dive right into it with Frances Walters, who spent a um, dozen years of her life in the innocence field. And uh, we're very honored uh, and pleased to have her join us today. Hi, Frances. How are you doing? And what did you bring in your I'm mug? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm not a big mug collector, but I have one with my three kids on there. Oh. They're four, six, oh, that's and eight. Cute. That's <laughs> um, yes, and, my... and Francis, so I'm gonna, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I'm I'm pretty boring. I just have the water in my mug. Well, water's good. Water's Water is good. good. Water's, awesome. water's always a have, good thing. Did you have that mug specially made where was that like a Mother's Day good? Cause we got Mother's Day coming up next month. Yeah, I, I actually had it made for my mom. We actually, when we moved back to Ann Arbor, we moved in with my parents. And so it was a thanks for letting us all crash here type of gift for them. Cool. Oh. Very nice. And I love yeah. your background. I mean, that looks like um, Michigan, the quad. Yeah, it looks yeah. like a quad. Is that it? Yeah. I mean, one of the nice things is all the institutions have released nice Zoom backgrounds um, so you can hide kind of the mess that's behind. <laughs> oh, it looks great. I need to get one. Beautiful. So for the audience, though, Francis, I'm going to go over your bio so everybody knows, you know, who you are, your background. So you're so Francis is interim director of the Conviction Integrity and Expungement Unit in the Washtenaw County Prosecutor's Office. Prior to joining the Washtenaw County Prosecutor's Office, Francis was the legal director at the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project, where she supervised, investigated, and litigated DNA and non-DNA cases. Francis has worked in the innocence field for over 12 years, having started as a member of the inaugural class of the Michigan Innocence Clinic at the University of Michigan Law School, where she graduated magna cum laude and order of the coif. Uh, she continued her work on innocence cases after joining the firm, the law firm of Williams and Connolly, successfully seeing her first MIC case through to exoneration. Prior to her legal career, Frances earned a BS in engineering from Princeton University and was a teacher for six years. Oh, that's great. I teach, uh, including as a lecturer as, at the University of Cape Town, which is also awesome. I've been there. Frances is a member of of the Michigan, D.C. and Maryland bars. So again, welcome, Francis. And uh, why don't you tell the audience, like, what motivated you to get into this, like, the innocence field and now the expungement field? Yeah, I mean, I didn't take a very direct path. I never thought I was going to be a lawyer. But when I went to Cape Town for a couple of years, um, I was teaching there at the University of Cape Town, and it was a program where they allowed students into universities. And it was actually a law that universities had to um, admit students they might not have in the past, um, 
but it was an effort to make up for post-apartheid gaps in education. And so I taught that um, an extra year. So these students who were admitted under the law, they had to take an extra year to catch up on um, math and other subject areas. And so um, I was there for that. And it really struck me that the work I was doing, I was able to do because of this law. And that's kind of what spurred me into thinking, maybe I want to um, do something different. I do enjoy teaching. Um, and I know Robin, you teach really interesting courses that look like. Um, and so um, I just thought maybe there was something else, a different approach I could take. Um, and uh, I continued teaching for a while in the States. And while I really enjoyed it, I just kept being tugged and I felt like there was something more I wanted to do. Um, and when I went to law school, I initially thought that um, I wanted to do child advocacy law because I saw my students at school, they had so much going on at home that I couldn't really assist with. Um, and so I felt like that was an area maybe where I could help outside of school. Um, but then I went to law school and in my 2 all year, the Innocence Clinic started in Michigan. I decided, hey, like I've never tried criminal law. I've already made a career change. Why don't I try this out? And I fell in love. It, I mean, it was amazing. I, I worked, um, Dave Moran was my professor, as was uh, now Chief Justice Bridget McCormick. Oh, um, and, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, they were my professor. Well, I had not Moran, but I had Bridget McCormick was one of my professors. Okay. Yeah. No. And I mean, I went to a law firm for a little while just to make sure um, I tried out civil law and some other areas. And I was, I just, I kept returning to innocence work. And so um, I was very fortunate when the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project had a position open up. And so I joined them. Oh, that's, that's interesting. That's interesting, Francis, your background. And so, I mean, what do you think actually drew you to that area of the law, though? You know, the innocence uh, projects have really put a dent on helping innocent people um, you know, and I, when I hear Innocence Project, I do think of Professor Moran and I think of, uh, you know, Barry Shack. but what do you think it was about you or your personality that drew you to this, this field, this innocence field? Yeah, I mean, it all came together. I, um, you know, I really enjoyed working directly with clients, um, learning their stories, and oftentimes, you know, a lot of the people that wrote for help said, I just want somebody to listen. And so um, I was glad to be that ear and to be there. Um, I enjoyed the investigation piece. Um, I like going out and digging deeper into um, the records and talking to people, um, seeing if there's physical evidence. Um, I have a fairly strong science background. And so even the forensic science aspects um, drew me. Um, to the work. And I actually do enjoy writing briefs <laughs> um, okay. and doing legal research and writing. So I don't, all those pieces seem to come together here. Um, and so um, I, and obviously, you know, an innocent person being incarcerated is one of the worst wrongs that our society can commit. And so um, it, it's an important area for me. Um, and I, I, I've really enjoyed it. And I'm actually excited to have expanded working into the expungement field as well. Um, because, you know, when I was doing innocence work, oftentimes we couldn't find the new evidence you needed to prove someone was innocent. So we often had to close cases. Um, and it just felt like we were leaving a lot of um, people kind of out to dry a little bit. And so I, I really appreciate appreciate having the opportunity to help people in other areas, even if it's not necessarily like an innocence claim or um, where we can prove that someone is innocent. That's fantastic. It seems like you have, uh, no, it doesn't seem like, it is the fact that you have all of the, the qualities and characteristics of an individual who's just perfect for your new role in Washtenaw County as the interim director of the, I see um, below your face there, C-I-E-U. That's a <laughs> nice short way of saying it, but Conviction, Integrity and Expungement Unit Director. 
congratulations on that. Um, Thank you. So you know, yeah, so congratulations. So about the unit. It is, it's new, right? Relatively new? Yeah, so um, fortunately, the county commission um, was able to fund a temporary position to get the unit up and running. So um, when Ellie got into office, he was able to post this position, I think even before he got into office um, and interviewed and was able to bring someone in. And I'm very fortunate and I'm grateful that I was that person um, to start looking at policies um, putting in place best practices so that our office unit, once it was ready to get up and running, could go full steam ahead. Um, and so my temporary funding is through next month. Um, hopefully, we hope the commission um, votes to make it permanent next month. Um, but, you know, that way I was able to start in February. Um, as soon as the expungement laws went into effect, uh, the set aside laws um, on April 11th, uh, we already kind of had a procedure in place. We were talking to, um, we have several partners, um, the Michigan Advocacy Program uh, with their legal services for South Central Michigan um, and Michigan Work okay. Southeast. Um, we've been able to meet with them along with the city of Ann Arbor um, and kind of talk through how we were all going to work together to make this work. Um, oh, and I can't forget the Washington County Public Defender's Office as well. Um, and so um, we've had meetings and we've been up and running. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been working together um, to make sure we get everyone's records that they need to apply um, and to uh, figure out if people are eligible and to help them in any way we can. Um, and hopefully the same will be true if we get fully funded when our uh, conviction integrity part of our unit also uh, can fully get up and running. Right, when and I anticipate I'll be seeing you because I've got it. Like, you know, we've been doing it covering expungements, but now the law is in effect. So I've got <laughs> folks from Washtenaw County, Wayne, some Oakland. So I probably will be seeing you or interacting in some way or form because now you have more people that are eligible. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of getting the paperwork process and getting attorneys to help them to get their, you know, to try to redeem themselves. Yeah. And if there are questions, I know sometimes those I chats that get run. You know, um, I ran one for somebody and one of their convictions appeared twice for some reason. And so, you know, we're able mm -hmm. to help clear that up. Um, or if there are other areas, Robin, where you see the prosecutor's office can help clarify things that might be a mistake. Um, yeah, yeah we're, we're very open and happy to help in that area. Okay. And I think that, again, that makes a world of difference. I know I have a colleague out there, Sandra White, we were doing expungement forums with Judge Thomas, and she was saying sometimes she was coming in the old prosecutor's office and there was a lot of rigidity, um, there was resistance, and that that wasn't very helpful um, when we were trying to help people. So it does make, it, it makes a big difference to have your office and also the attorney general out there mm -hmm. um, willing to help, uh, you know, clear up folks' re records for people who are eligible. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's great. Tracy, you were going to say something earlier. Well, I, um, I'm sorry, I had to check my mute, make sure it was, uh, unmuted, but I, I'm accompanied uh, this afternoon by my, my faithful doggy, uh, Bella <laughs> sitting over there and sometimes she starts barking. So I apologies in advance if she does, but back to you, Francis, I, um, on, on the topic of expungement, since we're on that right now, um, if someone wants to inquire about getting an expungement through the Washtenaw County's Pros Washtenaw County Prosecutor's Office, how does how do they begin that application process? How do they connect up? Yeah, so um, I shortened my title to CIEU because um, we have an email address that's just CIEU at Washtenaw.org um, okay. and that is the best way for people to reach us. Um, if people don't have the email address, they have um, called our office and um, you know, people there that answer the phone are able to direct people to that email address. That's just the easiest way um, because you know, we, we need to make sure that um, people who write us understand that we're not their lawyers um, as prosecutor. I'm, because I'm in the prosecutor's office, we can't represent people. Um, and so what I, I try to explain to them, and it's easiest, obviously, when it's written, um, to say what we're doing is we're helping gather your records so that an application can be put together. And if needed, um, 
uh, once we have, for example, the ICHAT poll to look for eligibility um, and we are helping get the certified court records, um, they need the order of conviction for each case. Um, we're trying to help collect those and streamline that. Um, and once we have those, then either we can refer them to an attorney in the community or if they qualify for legal services um, of South Central Michigan to uh, represent them, then we can refer them there. So they'll be, we're trying to make it so that uh, we're assisting and streamlining everything, making things more efficient in the beginning stages so that um, when a person goes to an attorney or uh, goes to legal services, they have everything kind of together um, to make it easier for that application to be submitted. So this isn't self-help or pro se or impro per, uh, the people who do contact Washtenaw County Prosecutor's Office, they can get a referral to an attorney who could assist them further potentially. Yes. Uh, oh, that's yes, fantastic. That's, that's the idea. Um, I, I mean, once they have the records, people can apply pro per, but um, as you and Robin both know, it's still a fairly complicated it process. It is, even right. for lawyers, you know, and <laughs> even for lawyers with even, the new rollout of the Michigan's clean slave law, it's a little complex. We had, uh, yes. actually, that's an understatement. It's very complex. We had uh, right. State uh, Representative David Legrand on a couple of weeks back. And, you know, he's really up and up the architect of that um, new law. And, you know, he admits it's rather, you know, it's complex. So I'm glad that there's help out there for people. And how, how are you maintaining, how are you referring people to lawyers? Are you maintaining some sort of database or referral list? How are you getting the lawyers who are raising their hands to help people at maybe a low cost or reduced rate um, pro bono? Yeah, that's the piece I am building still right now. And so um, I am going to be doing some outreach to um, local attorneys and seeing if they want to be included on a sort of referral list. Um, uh, right now, I think a lot of the inquiries that people probably will can qualify for legal, either legal services or um, the public defender's office also um, can help represent. Um, but uh, where people might have a little bit more ability to pay, um, we want to be able to give them other referrals to people in the community because, I mean, I know, I mean, Robin, you've been doing great work. You've been going out um, and doing kind of the fairs or I don't know what you're calling them, but the forums, um, more we've forums, done yes. more educational forums and some fairs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know you had like Nick Rommel on um, last month and um, I know right. he's doing great work too. So, um, you know, we, we just want to make sure everyone has the help they need. Yeah, That's where we great. did, we did do, Tracy and I hosted a co-host of that, but that was the event with Nick Rommel um, and some of the politicians and the lawyers. And, um, and then I participated in a virtual fair on April 10th. And so uh, what we did is it was a, sh uh, a state, former state rep, Sherry Gay Dagnogel did an in-person educational part of it. And then there were those of us lawyers who volunteered to do pre-screening eligibility. And then some of us attorneys agreed to take on a couple of uh, people pro bono. And then, uh, you know, and then I have been in that, that process of uh, matching other attorneys up with folks that can't afford a lawyer. And so for Wayne County, they have, you, you may be aware of this already, they have clean slate and they have Lakeshore Legal Aid, but I've, I've already heard that they're filled to capacity. They're trying to recruit more attorneys. And then, so I've been in that position too, is trying to recruit attorneys. And it's like, I feel like the criminal defense attorneys that we're the most qualified to do it because we know the laws, but if we're already doing indigent work, it's kind of hard to ask us to do a lot of pro bono. And that's why I was like trying to look at more corporate attorneys who maybe they have a big salary, they can get, you know, they get trained and they can agree to do a certain amount a month, you know? Yeah, I think that's the same. Um, Michigan Advocacy Program are also trying to find, identify pro bono attorneys to assist in all, various counties, not just Washington County. Um, and I know that is an issue that people are running into. Um, and so we're hoping if we can spread out the work that maybe, um, you know, if we can lighten the load a little bit, um, then 
maybe there will be more people willing. I do know um, gathering the certified court orders and things like that has been kind of a barrier for uh, pro bono attorneys. And so if we can do that part um, and then just the application and maybe a hearing, and I know in Wayne County, they're doing some of this by stipulation now, um, but if there's a hearing, then maybe that's a lighter load that somebody can handle. That's great. And since the CIEU open, have you been uh, getting, um, has there been an avalanche of uh, people uh, calling you, contacting you for help? Yeah, I wouldn't call it an avalanche. It's actually, it's been pretty <laughs> steady. Um, we're, okay. uh, I'm grateful that like for a decent number, we have like a dozen people who have contacted us. Um, I'm still getting used to like reviewing everything and making sure I'm not dropping anything or letting anything through the cracks um, and, and working out kind of the payments for, you know, there, there are little pieces when we have to pay the court for the court records. Um, we're trying to smooth that out. So I'm glad it hasn't been um, too heavy a stream right now um, so that we can work out these kinks. But um, what one of the things we're going to do is we're trying to, Ellie's been trying to get out information on social media um, we're going to do kind of a day of service where um, we go out into the community and give out pamphlets and um, where people can go to our website um, and learn more about whether they're eligible, um, what services we're offering, what services our partners are offering. Um, and so we're trying to get the word out because I think uh, one of the issues is that a lot of people don't even know that they're now newly eligible still. I agree. You know, I, you know, think that the media has been doing an okay job mm -hmm. with talking about, you know, the rollout of the new clean slate law um, as it pertains to expungements. But um, I think you're right on target. A lot of people just don't know that uh, there's help available. You know, there was that burst, you know, uh, uh, April the 12th, you know, and then you don't really hear that much. So it is a job, you know, to keep that top of the mind for the public so they can realize that there is help out there for them. So uh, kudos to you and Prosecutor Ellie Savitt for um, arranging for this day of service. And social media is a great tool to um, amplify that message as well. Do you find that social media is uh, really helpful to your unit? Yeah, I mean, I think um, several people found us, like they wrote us directly to our email and I think that was from social media and hopefully that makes it easy for them to then pass on information to people they know. Um, and I mean, a lot of the communications I'm getting initially are just like, I don't even know where to start. Can you, you know, I know I have something old on my record, like, can you help me? Um, and so, you know, I, we're really happy even just to get people started in the process, even if they don't eventually want us to um, be the ones to gather their records. Yeah, and I did put your information, the, the, the email that you referenced in the chat, because um, we're on YouTube, but uh, on my Facebook page. And yeah, I have, uh, I mean, Tracy and I, we, we were doing, you know, I've been doing the forums for a number of years. And then last year, we started doing forums with the politicians as we knew that the, the law was subject to change. And so we did, uh, you know, we did some some programming with the late state representative Isaac Robinson um, and, and um, uh, former state rep Mary Waters and then David Legrand. And we did one where uh, Tracy talked about, I have, uh, she talked about juvenile expungements and then I talked about adult expungements. And so I would say I've been flooded with calls probably the last couple of years, but even more recently, I'm getting like three to five calls every day. And it's like, some people have money, some people don't. And so I'm just trying to, I'm pulling everybody's eye chat and I, I have an assistant, thankfully, Ed out there, who's my assistant, who's helping um, Ed dance. He's, he's actually um, Ellie's uh, former uh, yeah. deputy director, no, campaign director. But Shout it, out to Edward Dance. Yeah, and I, I'll probably be looking at, one of my friends suggested I get connect with some of the students from U of M, you know, our mm -hmm. alma mater, because I'm just like, this is a lot. There's a lot of folks. And um, but you, we definitely want to help people because what when when I've interviewed people, even in the in the past, you would interview a lot of people, and most people were not eligible because it was before mm -hmm. it was the one felony and the two 
misdemeanors. Mm -hmm. So it was really sad because you're turning people away. Judge Thomas, uh, my my mentor, uh, we call her the the expungement queen. She we, she would hand out materials for felony friendly jobs because and talk about entrepreneurship because you you just feel sad to turn people away because she would actually hand out the application. And now under the new law, you have the three felonies, unlimited misdemeanors. And but it doesn't mean, you know, that every every misdemeanor, every felony is eligible. And but I'm being flooded. I'm being flooded with calls. And that's why I've been putting together a referral list for attorneys that will do expungements for a, a reasonable rate. And then I've also I'm getting it's a smaller list of attorneys that are saying they'll do it pro bono because most attorneys that are in private practice are saying to me, look, I've got to eat. So, you know, I think that there's definitely um, Tracy and I interviewed uh, one of the county commissioners in Wayne County, but I would definitely like to see it in Washtenaw County as well, like more funding being put in place to pay attorneys to handle expungements for people so that they can get get jobs or advance on their jobs. Yeah, no, I mean, it's super important. And I know, like, for example, Michigan Works has gotten several grants, but, you know, there's a limit. And if, given the number of people who are newly eligible, we do need to find other sources to be able to assist people. Um, I mean, by statute, there's a $50 fee to the Michigan State Police, and that has to be covered somehow. And so, um, yeah, no, I, you know, all the work you're doing, Robin and Tracy, is really important important um, and very necessary. Um, and I may be calling you Robin <laughs> to talk yeah, to I, I some of this. Yeah, yeah Robin, I she's be doing, doing some fundraising. Yeah, but yeah, yeah I mean, doing oh, sorry. Um, no, but I was just, Robin's doing <laughs> sorry, Tracy, lifting. go ahead. <laughs> yeah, well, Tracy has table. committed to doing juvenile. So we got a commitment. She said, oh, she'll good, do excellent. So I'll do some okay. adult, Tracy will do some juvenile. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I stick to what I know. I, ex I exclusively practice in the, um, on the domestic relations docket and the family courts. And so, you know, I, you mentioned neglect and abuse cases earlier. I, that's strictly what I do on the juvenile court side. And I do represent juveniles uh, in connection with juvenile justice. But I've got to say, I really do not get contacted very often about juvenile expungements. And I always remind my clients, you know, we can get this expunged for you. I, you know, give them my business card. I urge them to contact me. And um, I, I just, I never hear back from them. Uh, so I find that interesting. Um, and, um, you know, I just wonder, Francis, um, from a national perspective, you know, Michigan is now the leader when it comes to the rollout of the clean slate law, uh, followed by California and New Jersey, as I understand. And then with respect to these uh, conviction integrity units, that's also a trend I noticed locally. Wayne County has a conviction integrity unit. Uh, of course, Washtenaw County, your county does. I uh, read a media article the other day that Oakland County is now rolling out um, their own version of the Clean Slate project that was launched in Detroit. Do you think that this is a trend that will continue in terms of uh, criminal justice reform and you know restoring people? Um, what do you think? I really hope so. Um, in DC, they were doing a lot of um, work around resentencing, um, especially of people who committed crimes. And now it's it's official, they expanded it to 25 um, or younger. And so, but like for people who have already served their time, resentencing is not really a uh, solution. And so um, I think that expungements and helping people get these set aside and so that they can get employment and um, and housing, stable housing and things like that. I mean, it's really important. Uh, we know that we, um, are, we as a country have over prosecuted and over sentenced people. And so um, one of the ways to uh, address that is to make sure that we have laws in place to allow people to set their convictions aside when they have shown that they've done everything right after that point. Um, and so um, I, I, th I do think it's really important. Well, you have an interesting perspective, I imagine, because I find it fascinating that you 
lectured at the University of Cape Town. I myself have never been to South Africa, but um, so with that in mind, why do you think America does such an awful job, you know, has such a problem with incarcerating the innocent, especially when you compare, you know, we're supposed to be the super country, you know, the world leader. Why do we do such a terrible job, you know, especially compared to other countries, in particular Europe? That's a really good question. Um, one of the things we were really looking at at the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project before um, I left there, um, we had our investigator trained in the peace method, which is a different kind of um, interviewing of witnesses and suspects. Um, Okay. As you both probably know, in the U.S., for a very long time, and even still, the remnants of the Reed method are is still used, um, and that's a very um, that is a guilt focused um, method. It's an interrogation. It's not an interview. And in Europe, they have adopted this peace method, and they have actually found that they've been able to get. Um, more reliable information um, from both witnesses and suspects um, using this method. And it's very much more of like a rapport building conversational um, way. And for some reason, I think here, we thought really that the way to get people to talk is to put pressure on them. Um, yeah. Use threats and promises um, and to get people to... Um, well, for suspects, when you suspect someone, you are expecting a confession. Um, and that really um, is focused on people who you believe, and you have to be right, that the person's guilty. Um, and so oftentimes you don't have the right person. And so using this method is not very effective. Um, and they have found that to be true also with witnesses um, where you're pressuring them and you expect them to say or give a particular statement. Um, if that is actually what they know, that's great. Um, but if the person actually does not know anything or what they know does not line up with what uh, the law enforcement agencies believe, then it is not a reliable method to use. Um, and so that was one of the um, areas where we really were looking at making sure our methods were aligned with a more reliable um, interviewing methods so that, you know, we weren't then uh, getting false information. And right. That. And the that's often what I have happened is I have clients that after they they say, that's not what I said in the, the statement. I didn't say that. They twisted my words. That's what, you know, I'm sure Tracy, you, you've done criminal defense too. You often hear the client saying, that's not what happened. That's yeah, not what I said. The cops say, I got him on tape, man. Okay. You can, <laughs> you know, here's a discovery. All right. You know, but that was because my client had, usually they're like, we're 17 year olds before they raise the age. And they had been away, you know, from home for hours and they were hungry and they were tired and they'd say anything to get the heck out of the, you know, the lockup, you know, so, uh, and, and by that time, it's just the whole case goes to pot, you know, there are some things that, as you know, you can do to remedy it, but yeah, so, yeah, um, but, you know, Francis, I have another question for you. Um, I really want to get your take on this, um, this article that came out recently about, um, you know, Michigan needing uh, 7 million to pay the wrongfully convicted in order to avoid going into debt. You know, the Wrongful Imprisonment Compensation Act was enacted in 2016 and it requires the state to pay individuals who are wrongfully convicted $50,000 for each year they spent in prison. I mean, what do you make of all of this? this? I mean, it's really hard. You're weighing somebody's life where they spent a number of years wrongfully incarcerated. Um, how do you put a number on that? And I know in Virginia, there is a cap on how much you can um, compensate a person um, outside oh. of like a civil lawsuit. Um, yeah. So, you know, I I mean, I think Michigan is right in not creating these limits, these artificial limits, when they have wrongfully taken a large portion of someone's life. Um, but I mean, I I understand budgets, and uh, it, 
it's it's a difficult thing. How do you pay and, for it? Yeah, I mean that is the yeah. big question. This is why I'm not a legislator, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I I think people are owed. Um, you can't make up for what has been taken right. away from people, and um, hopefully, I mean, this will make people think twice about policies that are in place and how do we avoid this in the future. Um, I mean, hopefully that is the outcome um, rather than um, a focus on uh, the money that is going where, I mean, it should go to the people who are wrongfully convicted. Um, And so uh, I think that is a balance that needs to be struck. And I don't envy the legislators having to figure out where (laughs) this is coming from, but at a certain point for certain areas i don't think we can um money shouldn't drive um the remedies that are available um, right i think that's, yeah, that's what, because be of what, because of that i've seen that i think that's what drives me to do more preventative work like i've done expungement i still do expungement but i do programming on what to do when stopped by the police so i can try to encourage especially the young people to avoid situations where they get caught up and you know and cuz like tracy and i typically see people after they've given away most of their rights and we're in damage control mode. So I really would prefer that people not give up their rights. And I mean, if they're innocent, that they not be charged. And I know Tracy and I have interviewed guests and one of the hot topics has been facial recognition technology. And they had that that Robert Williams, that guy that he was wrongfully identified and incarcerated. And I mean, do you, do you have a position or does your office have a position on the facial recognition technology? Um, I don't, I mean, it's, it's been discussed. Um, There's hasn't been an official policy published. Um, I've actually been trying to follow um, the developments in Virginia. Um, They passed a law where uh, a law enforcement agency can't start using facial recognition without the state legislature approval. Um, And so that um, just passed there. Um, I don't think it has been signed into law yet, but um, so I, I mean, lots of people are looking into this. Um, And I think where um, until they can show that the programs are not racially biased in a way where they are misidentifying people of specific um, ethnicities and races, like as a wrongful, as as someone working on conviction integrity, it just seems like that, it needs to be very carefully looked at before any law enforcement agency implements it and a prosecutor's office relies on it. Um, so that's not the official stance of our office, um, but in, in my looking at the issues, um, you know, that, that's where I'm landing right now, given the, um, the outcomes that are being, uh, I guess, researched right now and um, the, the publication of what they have found about the um, particular facial recognition programs that are being used. Okay. And then I see that the Supreme Court, another topic that Tracy and I have talked to our guests about is, um, you know, carrying a concealed weapon. Uh, there's issues in Wayne County. There's a lawsuit against the their, their office, uh, the sheriff's office, because their office hasn't been readily processing CPL licensing and um, but there is a Supreme Court case. They're supposed to evaluate the issue of carrying a concealed weapon and the Second Amendment. And um, do you have a position on that? Like, how do you think that people that carrying concealed weapon is constitutional having those kind of statues or? You know, I haven't read enough about that. Um, I know it's a challenge of a New York law, right? That's been around for quite some time. Um, but I. I would say that I would need to uh, read about that a little bit more. That's not an area I'm totally familiar with. Right. Yeah, that that is a little off topic, but um, I would like to comment on that that um, case out of New York. Um, it appears that you know the U.S. Supreme Court hasn't taken up a case on gun rights in about eleven years, and um, many pundits and legal experts are saying that. 
um, well, this could uh, signal that there will actually be an expansion of gun rights. Interestingly enough, in, um, in an America where it just seems like there are shootings every day, which is very ironic. Now, I myself am a proponent of the Second Amendment. I totally believe in it. But as a lawyer, I just find it fascinating. But Francis, I want to take you back to your interesting time um, in South Africa at the University of Cape Town when you were a guest lecturer. And I, this is a two-part question. What were some of the topics that you lectured on and how would you compare um, the South African system of uh, justice compared to the American system of justice, which, you know, is very flawed? Yeah, um, so my focus was teaching numeracy, so literacy with numbers and math. And so I was very, numeracy. And so I was very focused in that area um, with the students, um, trying to get them caught up to a point. We also taught them Excel um, so that they had some computer literacy as well, things that um, maybe they weren't able to get in their schools um, that were still suffering from a apartheid effects. Um, and so um, it was a very technical area, um, but I, you know, it, it was meaningful in that, you know, there were students who had come who had never seen a computer before. And so. Um, and when were you there? What, when were you in uh, Cape Town? I was there from January 2002 to the end of 2003. Oh, okay, because I was there in 1999 and I I took a class. I wonder if you may have taken a class too. I took a class on constitutionalism in South Africa with- I took uh, that later, yeah. Oh, you did? I okay, with Carthy yeah. Governor and, and David yes. Chester. Yes, I <laughs> love that class. And then there were supposed to be 15 of us that went to South Africa and ended up being 12 because they had, you know, they US News and World Report, they nominated uh, Johannesburg, one of the most dangerous cities in the world. Yeah. and. <laughs> And I, my parents were freaking out. My dad was freaking out. And he's like, how are you going to go? You know, he, he was offering me going to France. I, I studied in France in college. And he's like, you're my investment. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to Johannesburg. I'm going to Pretoria. I went to Pretoria and I went to Cape Town. And I said, he's like, you can't go. You're my investment. I said, well, your investment's about to go international. And I, I loved being there. Um, the people there, I don't know if it was the same when you were there, but um, the people were had such hope and such uh, vision about what could happen in South Africa. Like um, when I was there, it was and Becky was the president. Like who was the president when you were there? Yeah, it was Tabo Becky. And Becky, okay. Yeah. yeah. But no. You, but you know, Francis, you said that you you lectured on literacy, but you know, in the United States, there is a connection between literacy and school performance and what they call the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. And were, were there any parallels there in, in Cape Town and South Africa with that? I mean, I know it's another country, a completely different system, but you know, we, we've got it uh, like this in America where this third grade reading law, if, if children are reading by at a certain level, uh, by the time they reach third grade, they're uh, trying to figure out how many prison beds, you know, they're going to, create for these kids. And I think that's really appalling, quite frankly. So was there any intersection there uh, that you found when you were lecturing in Cape Town on literacy? Well, we also worked with adults. And, um, you know, what we saw is, as Robin pointed out, in South Africa, the crime rates are really high. Um, there was lots of violent crime, and a lot of that was tied to in income inequality. Um, people were still living in shacks, um, it was, you know, it was really tied to poverty. And so I do think there are several um, parallels. And so this program and that law, which allowed students to um, go to university when perhaps they wouldn't have been admitted otherwise, um, you know, it was really trying to address that to help people get the skills they needed to get a better job, um, much like we're trying to do with these expungements, um, but I mean, on a very extreme scale there. And so um, helping people so that, um, you know, if they didn't get the math education or the, or the, the reading education, um, literacy education, that um, they would have those skills so they could apply for 
specific jobs that required that um, so that they could get that promotion um, and maybe move their family out of the, the townships where there was extreme poverty. Um, so, I, I mean, there are direct parallels um, to what was going on in South Africa. Yeah, I would say in some ways when I the work I've done in Detroit, I see, um, you know, because I had always had a, a dream about working with the United Nations. But then when I as I worked in Detroit, in the juvenile court, the criminal court, I'm like, this is like working in a third world country, some of the conditions that are here. I know in South Africa, in 99, when I was there, they were still trying to have get wa like basic water, electricity mm -hmm. into the shanty towns. And like, like you were talking about, they were still giving, they were giving educational opportunities to, to you know, to the black folk, to the, to the, um, the colored, you don't say, I mean, you say colored over there, you don't say color over here is different. The colored folk, uh, all the oppressed people, Indian folk, they were trying to give opportunities to people who didn't have it. And and you had a, a system where, um, you know, the blacks had the political power, but the white people still had economic power and the white people tended to be more educated than, than the black folk. And um, I remember there was a, I was in Stalinbosch um, and it was a woman who was saying it was, she was a white woman and she had a, a like a, a colored or black maid, right? And she was saying, before apartheid, it was, she said, before it was apartheid for the blacks and now it's apartheid for the whites. And but she's saying that and she lived in a big house and she got a black maid. <laughs> and I was just sitting there like, what is she talking about? I was just like, what is it? You know, but you know, here, that's what I look at with this expungement. When you, when you, you know, just, we did it on April 10th. Um, some of us lawyers volunteered and we're talking to people and you're hearing their stories about how they apply for a job. And they're like, it's a common refrain. I, I applied for a job, I got a job. And then they're like, well, then the record came up and they had to let me mm -hmm. go. Or uh, I was, you know, a number of people said, okay, I have had a job for a number of years and I've tried to advance into management. And I couldn't advance because this came up. You know, I had a, a client, one of the last ones I did out of Washington. All, uh, he he worked as a mechanic, and but he and he was a really highly talented mechanic. And it had been 20 years since his uh, conviction had occurred. And he said he he wanted to get a management position, but he couldn't. So we went in and we got his record cleared as before Judge Brown. And so now he's able to advance. And I'm like, there there are like thousands of people like that. Uh, with misdemeanors and felonies um, that, you know, they want to get jobs, they want to take care of themselves and their family, they don't want to be dependent on the system. But because the way the laws have been, they, it's, it's an apartheid. I, I will always say this, you can see it on my videos too. America is like an apartheid system. It's American apartheid. Okay. We have a, a, yeah, in our justice system, it's American apartheid right here in the United States of America, I completely agree with you, Robin. Well, we have just a few minutes left and um, I just, I wanna get a chance to ask Francis about the Conviction Integrity Unit. Do you have very many cases at the moment? And, you know, what, what's the threshold? You know, um, do people have to, you know, prove actual innocence like in the Innocence Projects or how does it work? Yeah, so um, as we get started, we are saying, you know, if you are saying you are factually innocent, actually innocent um, on the facts, um, which is why I say factually innocent, um, okay. then, you know, please write us, tell us your story, um, tell us, you know, give us information about your case um, and what your theory of innocence is. Um, and, you know, most cases, if the person is was convicted in conviction uh, in Washington County, um, and um, they are claiming that they did not do whatever they were convicted of, um, then we'll do a preliminary screening of that case. Um, and I know, I mean, legally, you generally need new evidence of innocence to prove to the court. Um, but you know, from my experience at the Mid Atlantic Innocence Project when you're incarcerated, like you don't have access to witnesses who might recant. You don't have access to the physical evidence. Um, and sometimes the evidence, what we found in a lot of our cases was intentionally or unintentionally not given over to the defense. And so when the prosecution or the police have not handed over 
evidence that might show the person is innocent, then how can we expect someone to already have that information when they write us? Right. So what right. we really want to know is just your story, write to us. We will start digging to see what we have in our files, um, to see what information we have, um, and maybe from the law enforcement agencies, and we'll investigate those. Um, we haven't, we're not officially up and running yet, um, but oh, the Michigan Innocence Clinic has, um, has referred a couple cases to us. Um, oh. We've had some people um, file like 6,500 motions. And if there's an innocence component to that, um, I, our unit will review that even if you did not write to the Conviction Integrity and Expungement Unit specifically. Okay. Um, and so we have a number of cases and we're going to um, work with also the AGs CIU um, to, because I know they have some cases where people wrote to them from Washington County as well. So we're going to collaborate with them as well. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, well, that's very exciting. And I'm so glad to see that there's all this uh, energy and synergy in Washtenaw County. Uh, it's very promising. So I congratulate you on your new position and you know you're I know you're the interim director but you know hope and anticipate that you will become the full-time director of the CIEU and what do you hope to see for these two units you know um, in terms of your metrics within the next um, you know two to five years can you make any projections um in terms of projections uh I think that's hard uh I are there goals was, for the unit? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of our goals is to, um, if we get permanent funding, we're hoping to get a more fulsome expungement program going. Um, and Robin, you mentioned working with law students and, you know, that's part of our hope too, so that, you know, I can supervise the collection of records and then a supervising attorney not in the prosecutor's office can supervise students helping people go through the application and hearing um, because as Robin mentioned, there's much need for attorneys um, or student attorneys who can help under supervision. And so um, that's one of our hopes. And we, we really want um, that 6.5% number of people who have been eligible for expungement. We want to see that number grow exponentially as, you know, I know you, Tracy and Robin, you both want to see that as well. And the, all the people who have been working so hard to get um, the clean slate legislation um, passed and in place, uh, I, you know, and so I think we really want to see that number hit a significant increase um, because, you know, as that Michigan law study showed, you know, people saw a 22% increase in wages just after a first year after expungement. And so wow. we really want people to take advantage of um, the expungement laws and we're happy to do whatever we can. Um, in terms of conviction integrity portion, it's really hard to say. Um, at the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project, a non-DNA case took us seven and a half years to wow. investigate, wow. litigate and get relief for somebody on average. and. Um, we worked often with the Baltimore City Conviction Integrity Unit, and okay. when they got a case and were interested, they were able to get all the records right away because they had access. Um, they didn't have records that were all redacted, so you couldn't even tell, like, what the witness names were. Um, and, okay. you know, the fastest ones where they got a letter from someone who was incarcerated um, about like, him and his co-defendants, Within like four months, there was an exoneration for them. Wow. That's, that's yeah. And, yeah. and that's so, amazing. Um, I mean, I, I would like our, in terms of metrics, I would like our process to be able to um, review a case that quickly. I mean, it shouldn't take seven and a half years yeah. of someone being additionally incarcerated. Um, and part of that was just because, you know, we would have to submit a FOIA request and like maybe a year later, we would get a bunch of redacted documents. Um, and slow so, of justice. But now was that that was in another state though that that was happening? Was that is that correct? Yeah. So we did. We we worked in Maryland, D.C. and Virginia. Um, oh, yeah. I say that because Michigan is not known. You know, it's one of the worst states in America when it comes to sunshine. 
laws, you know, the transparency is abhorrent. And uh, I know that there is a movement afoot in the Michigan legislature to uh, do better, you know, to, to legislate improvement because it's all part and parcel to helping free innocent people. Yeah, yeah and I mean, see too, I was saying with the legislature too, about, I was talking back about expungement. When we talked to Representative Legrand, he believes, he said that we could probably help a million people. It might be more. I mean, there's what about 9 million people here in Michigan? I don't, we probably have to have the 10 lost. million 77,000, according to the US Census data that came out yesterday. Okay, so that's right. That's right. <laughs> We're still losing a congressional seat yeah. though. Okay, then we need to redo the census. But Francis, I'm sorry, you were going to say something about um, conviction integrity. Oh, I was just saying, I mean, where um, the FOIA and the Sunshine Laws are not super expansive. I mean, that's where the counties, the prosecutor's offices, having a conviction integrity unit is really important. Um, because then you have someone who has access to the information who can look through it um, instead of... Um, you know, the Michigan Innocence Clinic has done fantastic work um, and they've been very successful, but it's still slow for them because of all these barriers. And so where there are conviction integrity units, they're able to get more access to information quicker um, mm. so that we can, you know, you can, a lot of innocence claims can't be substantiated. And so you end up closing a case, but like you shouldn't drag that out for to drag that process out for five years to then tell someone, well, we weren't able to find anything to prove your innocence. And so we have to close your case. You're really, I mean, even for that person, you're dragging it out, but where you can actually prove innocence, you know, making someone wait in prison for seven and a half more years until somebody looks at their case and can figure it out. Um, it's just unjust. And so um, I, we, I really hope that the conviction integrity unit um, movement continues. Yeah, I, I agree. agree. Yes, yeah, so and, and anything that we can do to help, it. yeah, let yeah. us know. But uh, yes, uh, it's been fantastic talking with you about your new position in Washtenaw County as the interim director of the Conviction Integrity Unit and the Expungement Unit. And I know I, for one, I, I know you join me, Robin. I'm looking forward to hearing more about all of your great work. So. Uh, again, congratulations, and uh, I just think it's uh, fantastic for Washtenaw County and all of Michigan. Yes, Thank congratulations. So I'm sure I'll be seeing you with some some meetings coming up and talking about some of these issues. So, um, yeah, welcome back. I know you were here before, so you're welcome <laughs> back to Michigan. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah. Um, so this yeah, and if we if if we can help with anything, please reach out. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Political Coffee with Robin and Tracy and our special guest, Francis Walters, who is the Washtenaw County Director of Conviction Integrity and Expungement Unit. And uh, I have my mug slow down. Hopefully I'll slow down. I don't know. I'm, 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 I was a runner, so we'll see. <laughs> so you guys have a blessed evening. Okay, great. Thanks, Robin. Bye. Thank Bye, you. Robin. Bye, Francis. Thank you, Francis. Keep up the great work. Keep fighting. Thanks, Excellent. So work. nice talking to you. Great.